Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Dental Week. And um, today we are going to talk about safe anesthetic dentistry because I know that for so many of you, that just instills panic that you are so worried about losing your pet under anesthesia for a dental cleaning that it's very easy to keep putting it off or to avoid it. And I, I understand. Um, I have had many, many, many animals over the years and I have had dental cleanings under anesthesia done on all of my dogs and cats multiple times each. So, um, I understand the hesitancy and I happen to have a lot of old animals, a lot of animals with heart disease and other issues. And certainly that does kind of instill a little bit of panic. So my hope today is that I can help you be a little less panicky and understand what steps need to be taken to ensure that your pet will come through this um, without any problems. And I can tell you that in 37 years of practice, I can remember two or three animals that we lost under anesthesia for dentals, um, usually cats. Uh, and it, they were cats that had underlying heart disease that we didn't know about. Cats are different from dogs, and that's another whole discussion as far as heart disease with kitties, but dogs are real nice. They tell you that they have heart problems. They develop murmurs. They develop a cough. It, they develop heart enlargement on x-rays. Kitty cats can have severe heart disease with no murmur, no enlargement on x-rays, and the only way that you would know would be to have an echocardiogram done. So cats are a little bit different. Um, but with the thousands and thousands and thousands of dentals that were done in my clinics over that 37 year period, I can tell you that the safety record uh, is extremely high. So um, what's, the, what's involved when we're going to have uh, an anesthetic dental cleaning done on our pets? First thing is you need to get that dental exam with your veterinarian to know that your pet needs to undergo a, an anesthetic dental procedure. And remember that yesterday we talked about 75% of the dental disease occurs below the gum line. So you won't even know that your pet has a lot of their dental disease until they are sedated and have those radiographs done. So if you know that your pet is going to go in and have that procedure performed, what do you need to do to prepare for that? And how do you make sure that your pet will be safe under anesthesia? So the first thing, you need to go in and have a complete physical examination done by your veterinarian. And it, we don't want some little cursory, you know, oh, looks good to me. No, we need to do a full exam, listen to both sides of the chest, listen to all the lung fields, listen to um, all the different areas on the chest with the different heart valves on both sides need good abdominal palpation. And absolutely, if it's not recommended, you need to request full lab work, a full CBC, chemistry, urinalysis, uh, potentially a thyroid test if your animal is middle-aged or older. I think that sometimes we have undiagnosed hyperthyroidism in kitty cats that causes heart disease secondarily, and that could be part of the anesthetic risk for kitty cats. Um, I would also recommend, particularly if your animal is middle-aged or older, that you get a chest x-ray. It is amazing how many times we would find a mass in the chest or heart enlargement or fluid in the chest that we would not have known about just by doing the physical exam. I understand that this is adding layers of cost onto these procedures, but if you are really, really worried about your pet undergoing uh, anesthesia for dental work, then it really pays to be proactive and know that your pet is healthy, that their liver is functioning well enough to handle the anesthesia, that their kidneys are functioning well enough to handle the anesthesia, and that there's nothing going on in their chest as far as heart disease, lung disease, that might make them a poor anesthetic uh, candidate. So uh, once you have all of your pre-op 
um, labs and x-rays and everything looks okay. You've got the green light to go ahead. And with this said, I will tell you that we put a lot of animals under anesthesia that had really bad kidney values, um, bad liver values. The anesthetic protocol can be changed to have the anesthesia that is uh, processed more by the liver or processed more by the kidneys, depending on um, what, I'm sorry, I'm watching this puppy who's chewing on everything in sight. Um, so we can change our anesthetic protocol based on what the organ function is with the animal that we're working with. And it's very, very important that we know uh, the blood pressure of the animal, the status when we're going in so that we can um, modify our treatment protocol while the animal is in the hospital. So once you get the green light to go ahead, you're going to drop your animal off for surgery or anesthesia uh, to have the dental cleaning done. When you drop them off, they're definitely going to give you an estimate, sign in, uh, have you sign all the forms. On those forms, almost always, you will be asked to give a red, green, or yellow light as far as if the animal should have a crash under anesthesia as far as CPR. Don't let that scare you off. It is normal protocol. Just like when people go in the hospital, we have to say if we have a DNR or if you know, if we have a living will, anything like that. So it's no different. It's just the veterinarian understanding and knowing what your wishes are if something should happen. So don't let it scare you. It's, it's not a red flag that, oh my gosh, they expect my animal to have his heart stop beating during uh, anesthesia. So it's just questions that need to be asked and make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, when you're signing your animal in for the procedure, do not um, opt to have vaccinations given while the animal's there. That's, they're under anesthesia. They have a stressful procedure for the day. That is not the time to have vaccines and other treatments being done. Uh, certainly if they need acupuncture or laser, something like that for uh, something else they're going on, arthritis, whatever, that could be done at that time, but not anything that is going to tax the immune system. So when your animal is admitted, they will be, um, or this is what you should be looking for. They should have an IV catheter placed and that is for access for medications that are going to be administered, also access, direct access to the vein if there should be a problem and uh, medication would need to be given for that. But also the animal should be on IV fluids. Every animal undergoing an anesthetic procedure should be on intravenous fluids because we need to make sure that the blood pressure is staying where it needs to be. If the blood pressure drops too much, we're not going to have good perfusion of the kidneys. And so the kidneys are needed to filter the anesthesia that is being given to get it out of the body. We need to um, make sure that the blood pressure isn't getting too high. So we need to monitor the fluid rate. So once your animal is set up with their IV catheter, their IV fluids, then generally an induction agent, which is a, um, an anesthetic agent that will uh, sedate the animal enough that then an uh, endotracheal tube can be put into their throat. The endotracheal tube is basically their airway, keeps their airway open and there's a little cuff that is blown up on that tube so that none of the saliva and fluid and debris from the dental cleaning can go down the airway. Um, so very, very important that the animals are intubated during the procedure. Because of the intubation, they can have a bit of a, a soft cough, sore throat for a couple of days. If any of you have ever been intubated, you know that your, your throat is just going to be a little irritated for a couple of days. So that would be normal. The animal should be monitored very closely while it's under anesthesia, and you should ask what kind of monitoring will be done. Things that should be monitored would include blood pressure, body temperature, oxygen saturation, carbon dioxide levels, respiratory rate, heart rate, and an EKG because the heart can sound okay. The heart, you know, if they're just getting something that is giving a heart rate, it says, oh, the heart rate's 100. If you're not looking at an EKG, 
you won't know if there are abnormal heartbeats going on or if there is an, an arrhythmia. So I always had an EKG monitor that was set up right next to the animal's head so that we could keep a really close eye on that. And our monitoring equipment also monitored the blood pressure, the temperature, the oxygen, the respiratory rate, all on one monitor, one machine, so that we could keep very close tabs on what was going on with the animal. And um, when they're being monitored, if all of a sudden there's a heart arrhythmia or the blood pressure drops or the blood pressure spikes, that gives you the ability to make instant changes. Very rare, but once in a while, I would have an animal that would have an uh, abnormal reaction to anesthetic. And we would say, okay, we're waking them up. This was a bad protocol for this animal. Doesn't mean they can't undergo anesthesia in the future. It means they can't undergo that anesthetic protocol and that we have a lot of different drugs to choose from. So um, once your animal is under, they're hooked up to their monitoring, they've got their fluids going, um, then the technician or veterinarian who's doing the dental uh, should do a full mouth exam with that dental probe that we talked about. They're going to scale off the tartar and plaque that's there. They're going to take x-rays of every single tooth. And those x-rays are going to show them that 75% of dental disease that is below the gum line. Very, very critical that that is done. If extractions are needed, Besides the uh, general anesthesia, the gas anesthesia that the animal is, is getting and anything that they got IV or intramuscular uh, before being put on the gas anesthesia, uh, they also can have nerve blocks put in place. Just like when we go to the dentist and we get those Novocaine injections in different areas of our mouth, the um, doctor or technician can do nerve blocks to block the pain of any um, extractions. And if the nerve blocks are used, the animals uh, come out of anesthesia with less pain, have less pain post-op. So the nerve blocks are, are pretty critical and um, very, very helpful. Extractions that uh, have any deep roots or there's um, open areas in the gums, a lot of times sutures will be placed and a little flap or gum flap will be placed over that. Uh, so it's important, and we'll talk about uh, caring for your pets post-op um, tomorrow or Thursday, uh, but it's pretty important that they're not chewing on things that are hard for a couple of days, particularly if they have sutures in there, because we don't want to break that down. Once the, um, the scaling has been completed, extractions have been done, then the teeth will be polished, just like when we go to the dentist and we have that polishing done at the end because the use of any instruments at all on the tooth enamel, whether that's the ultrasonic scaler or the hand scaling, it's going to cause microscopic scratches on the surface and uh, that damages the enamel and that can cause uh, further disease. So the polishing takes out any of those scratches in the enamel so that tartar and plaque can't grab back on there. Um, so, it would be impossible to do this level of cleaning, extractions, probing, especially on the inside of the teeth, those molars way in the back, without having the pet under anesthesia, it would be impossible to get those x-rays and really know what's going on. So you can see why it is so important to have anesthetic procedures done, but it's also very important that the people doing the procedure on your animal are taking all precautions and monitoring very, very well. Um, where I used to practice in New Jersey, we had a clinic, a, a, a high volume, low price veterinary hospital a few miles away from us. And so a lot of people would want to go there for their dental cleaning because uh, they could go there and get the $99 or the $199 dental cleaning. I can tell you there was not a registered technician in the building. There, every, all of their staff were basically people who came in off the street. I had one uh, horse client of mine. She was actually studying to be a school teacher. And she got a job at that clinic as a receptionist. She had been on the reception desk for two weeks they offered her the job of head technician. She had no training as a technician, none. 
ask about the training of the people who are going to be in charge of your pet while they are under anesthesia having this procedure performed. Um, critical, critical that the person doing the procedure knows what they are doing. And there's been a lot of debate online about um, whether the veterinarian should be the one performing the dental cleaning or the technician should be the one performing the dental cleaning. And I would put it to you that when you go to the dentist, your dentist is not the one who does your, your dental cleaning. It's a dental hygienist who is trained to do that. So in my clinic, all of my technicians were graduates of either two or four year college programs. They were well trained. And um, a lot of one of my technicians has been there for over 25 years and uh, doing the dental cleanings. So you need to get that information about who is doing the procedure. Frankly, I had my dentist do my dental cleaning once because they overbooked and the hygienist was uh, doing someone else at the same time as my appointment. The dentist did a terrible job. I would much rather have the hygienist, somebody who's trained to do this. Now, if you have a high risk patient, then perhaps you need the veterinary, a veterinary dental specialist to do the procedure for you. And we are going to have one of those specialists as our guest on Friday. Um, this particular practice is up in Pennsylvania. They're part of a group that has a, a couple of uh, clinics in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. They have board certified anesthesiologists and board certified veterinary dentists that do the procedures on the animals. It is definitely more expensive it's probably going to be two to three times the cost. But if you have a high risk patient, totally worth it. We took my mother's dog there. Um, maybe we'll talk about that case on Friday. Um, it was $4,000, but totally worth it because the dog uh, was 16 years old, had a lot of comorbidities, needed blood transfusion during the procedure. Um, so that was totally warranted. But it's, it's really just asking questions and feeling comfortable with the answers that you're getting, feeling comfortable with who is doing the procedure and uh, understanding what kind of monitoring is going to be done. Definitely important to have that pre-op workup really, really critical. You need to know what your pet's status is going in. If you have a pet with heart disease, certainly getting an echocardiogram before having them put under anesthesia is warranted. Um, all of our dogs, because of their heart disease, before I would do their dentals, they would go get their echocardiogram and I would get a sign off from my cardiologist. Yes, this pet is healthy enough to undergo that anesthesia. These are the uh, anesthetic protocols that would be good to use on this dog. These are the anesthetic drugs that should not be used on this dog or cat. So um, if you have an animal with those kinds of issues, then speak to your cardiologist. Um, once the animal is um, completed with uh, x-rays, extraction, suturing, polishing, then they'll be taken off their gas anesthesia um, and they are allowed to wake up with that tube still in their throat, just in case they would vomit or gag at, during recovery. We don't want them inhaling anything or aspirating anything. Once they are awake enough to kind of sit up sternally, they're swallowing, then we can pull that tube from the throat. They're still monitored as far as body temperature, pr uh, blood pressure, um, uh, respiratory rate, heart rate, all that kind of stuff until they're fully awake and walking around. Um, so, and then you can generally, I've, I've never seen anybody keep animals overnight, um, following dental procedures. So generally you would pick your pet up in the afternoon or early evening and be given at home instructions. I'm going to try to do a screen share. So for those of you on, um, Instagram, Maybe I can turn this around and you can, I can't see what my phone is looking at. Okay, so these are x-rays from Gwen's cat. So let's go back up here. Um, so this was, this is Reginald. He is 13 very shortly here. So this is uh, when he first came in prior to his dental cleaning, severe tartar, some gingivitis going on there. 
And this is after his cleaning. They cleaned up beautifully. Residual gingivitis, you can see we've got some redness secondary to the excessive tartar and plaque accumulation that will resolve over the next several weeks, especially with at-home care. Here's his endotracheal tube. You can see in his throat right here, this clear plastic. Let's see, that's before it was put in. All right, and so there's a big old chunk of tartar sitting on that tooth. These are his dental x-rays. So these are the upper incisors. There's a canine, there's a canine, there's his little incisors. This is his lower incisors and his big old canines. And you can see this is the canine. Here's the crown of the tooth starting there. Here's the root, it goes all the way down here. You can see the root is almost twice as long as the crown. And so what is this? Upper right premolars, red arrows point to areas of missing teeth. So we're missing some there and there. Um, green arrow points to a tooth affected by tooth resorption that received a modified extraction. So that's that guy. Um, upper right canine mild bone expansion and resorption affecting the tooth root only right there. So there's some, some of the root has uh, reabsorbed. Lower right premolars and molar, the red arrow points to a tooth that is missing due to reabsorption. The green arrow points to the tooth with severe reabsorption affecting the crown of the tooth, and that one was extracted. <laughs> hey, hey. Um, and there's his lower right canine mild reabsorption affecting that root as well. Upper left canine, some bone expansion. All right, and then these are lower premolars and molars. So there's one that's missing. There's a hole in that tooth right there. Um, and that was extracted because, and this one here too, there's a big hole in the tooth, which you would not have seen that just by looking at the top because they're right at the gum line. Okay. And post x-ray after the extraction to make sure they got all the roots. So this is, this is pretty critical to get all this and you would not get this with an awake kitty cat. All right, so let me stop that share. And then I've got this, which is his report. Do, 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 do. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so this is his um, uh, oral exam findings. So it says there were six missing teeth either not forming as a kitten, previous extraction, or that have fallen out. Several teeth with uh, tooth resorption were found. Then this just goes over the um, uh, radiograph findings, which we just looked at. And then uh, the extractions that were done. And then they used a temporary protective barrier sealant to help reduce the subgingival plaque buildup for one to two weeks and aid in healing the oral incisions. This is his dental uh, diagram, which they're color coded. So uh, where there are missing teeth, there are resorptive lesions, which ones were extracted. Uh, and then this was her. Uh, going home instructions. So, um, and we'll talk about this when we talk about post-op care in a couple of days. Uh, so he was sent home with pain medications, had a recheck scheduled and um, did very well. I, oh shoot, uh, I have, oh my long video ended. Um, I have to say that Gwen's um, veterinarian does a really, really nice job on these um, does a, a really good job. Okay, all right, great. So uh, that's the kind of information you should be getting from your dentist. Uh, Instagram folks, I'm sorry, my phone stopped. Um, the, uh, this is the kind of information you should be getting from your dentist. This is what you wanna be looking for. Um, I don't know that we ever sent home the dental diagrams like that with our, our clients, um, but we had them available for them um, if they wanted to see them. So hopefully this is helpful. Hopefully this will help set your mind at ease. It is possible to take animals with comorbidities like kidney disease, heart disease, liver disease, and get them through an anesthetic dental procedure. If they have rotten, painful teeth, it is unfair to allow them to suffer with ruined health and chronic pain. Dental pain is painful. So everyone have a wonderful day and we'll be on same time tomorrow. And I
think we're talking about post-op tomorrow. I can't really remember, but we'll get to 